Hello and welcome to the Two Gals and a Mic podcast. I'm your host, Sue Curver, and today I'm speaking with Jesslyn Ivan, who's an entrepreneur who literally will go to the ends of the earth in pursuit of love and adventure. Jesslyn is an elopement wedding photographer who's helping her clients have a true to them day in whatever space or place highlights their uniqueness. Jesslyn, welcome to the show. Hi, Sue. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm glad that you're here. And I love that I could introduce you as an adventure photographer who's providing imagery for people who may not want a traditional wedding. I can't wait to dig into what this actually looks like. I want to start by taking a step back and talking about your journey into this profession. Why photography? I have always been somebody who's been very interested in fine art. I didn't actually go back to college until I was almost 26. I knew that I wanted to pursue something that was creative and artistic in a way, but doing just fine art, like drawing, painting, the types of art that I had been, you know, studying in high school weren't quite what I wanted to do as a profession. So it was actually by happenstance that I got into photography. I had a digital point and shoot camera that was very old. I was at a friend's going away party and I brought along my little point and shoot. Somebody had spilt soda or something sticky on my camera at some point because the next time I went to use it a few days later the shutter wouldn't open and I was like what has happened to my camera so I went online and asked my general friend group on Facebook I need a new camera what do you guys recommend because all the other point and shoots just seemed really disappointing. The battery life was like 40 minutes tops. And I was going to my best friend's wedding back in New Hampshire. And I was like, I would like to have a camera to take some photos at my best friend's wedding. And one of my friends said, like, you should get a DSLR. And I was like, what the heck is a DSLR? Anyway, I started looking into it and I was like, that's more expensive than I would like. So I just want to interject for a second yes. to give some context. Is this... Yes pre-cell phone or pre-cell phone camera era? Yes, yes very much pre-cell phone era. There were no such thing as cell phone cameras. They were not a thing. Anyway, I looked into DSLRs and ended up purchasing a little $700 kit with, you know, the body, two lenses, a couple filters. And my best friend later that year, the same one whose wedding I went to, saw that I was getting really into it. She bought me a weekend seminar from Rocky Mountain School of Photography in Missoula. And so I ended up just falling in love with it because it had so much of the creative potential and that artistic side that I loved and really wanted in a career and a job. But it also has a very strong technical side where like you have to have knowledge of gear, what it does. So speaking of gear, how did you then pivot to elopement or backcountry wedding photography? After that weekend, I decided I wanted to go to school for photography. So I came to Bozeman. I went to MSU. And I went through the whole four-year photo program. I was focusing a lot on the outdoors, particularly women in the outdoors, but then also myself in the outdoors. I did a whole solo backpacking thesis, and that was something new and different. And I stumbled into weddings because a friend of mine wanted to have me photograph her wedding. That's how I got into weddings. And I was like, I really love them, but I personally don't feel entirely connected to a big traditional wedding because that's not, it's not really who I am. It's not what I would do. I'm very much, you know, a less is more person. Being outdoors is such an integral part of my life. And it wasn't until I saw somewhere on Instagram that there were people getting married out in like the Moab desert, you know, just them and eloping. And I was like, wait, that's a thing that I could do. And I was 
immediately smitten with the idea. I was like, finally, I can like still have the fun of working with people, capturing such a beautiful, joyous, fun day, but in a way that really excites me and excites the couple as well. So let's dig into this. Explain a little bit about adventure wedding and elopement photography. What does this practically speaking look like? What's a typical day for you or a typical event for you? There's a lot more work involved with being an elopement photographer than I ever had to do as a wedding photographer, to like a traditional wedding photographer. Generally speaking, you know, a couple talks with you, hires you, you show up on their wedding day at the venue, you photograph the day, you leave, give them their photos, you're done. But as an elopement photographer, you are generally speaking so much more than just the photographer. You know, you are helping this couple find locations, you know, because a lot of couples don't know exactly where they want to get married. They're like, yeah, we'd like to go to Glacier National Park, but we've never been there and we don't know where would be a good idea. How do we get permits? All that kind of stuff. So really the work starts right from the inquiry where I'm getting to know the couple, seeing if we're a good fit. And so it's, it's a lot of asking the right questions. I send out questionnaires to my couples to get an idea, you know, like what kind of scenery are you looking for? Do you prefer sunrise or sunset? What kinds of activities are you interested in doing? Tons of different questions so I can get a really good idea of what it is they want out of their day. And then that way, the recommendations that I make based on location or what we can do there really reflects who that couple is. It can look like a lot of different things. I've done big hikes with couples. I've gone sea kayaking in Alaska. I've gone mountain biking in Grand Tarhi to the Bluegrass Festival. Yeah, there's a lot of different possibilities. So what it looks like really is up to the couple, but it can look like a lot of different, very cool things. Do you have any stories that you can share about shoots that either pushed your limits or in some way challenged you? Oh, yes. Actually, the very first elopement that I had booked and photographed. Super sweet couple. They're they're actually from Missoula. And we went up to Glacier to have their elopement. We had everything planned. We had backup plans. It was like, okay, well, if we can't go here, then we can pivot to here. And it was all planned out, you know, West Glacier, kind of along the going to the sun road. And then at literally 8.45 p.m., the night before their elopement, they shut down the entire going to the Sun Road. So every single plan that we had was immediately out the door. And I was sitting in my hotel room in Whitefish, absolutely freaking out. I was like, oh my God, no, this cannot be happening. <laughs> like, what are we going to do? I was basically kind of in trauma mode where you're like trying to just like stop the bleeding. You're like, oh no, what do we do? How, you know, chaos has ensued. So I was on Google Maps, Google Earth Pro, all sorts of places, like looking for other locations that we could access. The couple, thank God, you know, mo every couple that I've ever worked with has been extremely easygoing and very laid back. And they're like, you know, you're the professional, you know what you're doing. We trust you. Even to this day, you know, it, it still kind of feels weird to hear people trust you completely in the process. Um, even though I've done it dozens and dozens of times, you know, that imposter syndrome never quite goes away. But this couple were, they were just so sweet. You know, we had the most beautiful sunrise elopement on Lake McDonald. Luckily that was still accessible. It was not beyond the road closure. After they got married and had their ceremony, they were like, you know what? I honestly don't care what the rest of this day looks like. We're married and this is the best. We couldn't imagine doing this anywhere else. And so anyway, we did pivot. We went all the way up past Pole Bridge to Lake Bowman. And, you know, they both said afterwards that this was even better than 
what we thought we had wanted. It's so much more quiet. It's beautiful. We had space to ourselves. This was awesome. We couldn't have asked for a better day. So that was, I'd say, probably right from the get-go, one of the most challenging because, you know, even though you come up with all of these backup plans, you know, for your couple, you're like, okay, well, this is closed. We can go here. And if that's, you know, not the case, we can do that. But you never know what Mother Nature is going to do. You know, a forest fire could break out, uh, flooding could happen, a freak snowstorm in August high up on a pass, you know, all sorts of things can happen. And so luckily, I am very knowledgeable about the places that I take my couples. And, you know, even if it means driving in a completely different direction, it's like, okay, you know, if we have to pivot, we can pivot and that's okay. And that's what I always express to my couples during the planning process is, you know, whatever plans we come up with are rough drafts, basically. They're not set in stone and having a flexible mindset, being open to pivoting is huge because we have zero control over what a national park is going to do as far as access or wildfire spreading those kinds of things. Have you ever had a couple ask you to do something physically that's outside of your parameters or your capabilities or something that you maybe don't know how to do in the backcountry? I have not had a couple yet ask me to do something that I was not capable or willing to do. I think if somebody were to ask me to go climbing with them, I might say no, because I myself am not a rock climber. I have done it and I know how to do it. If somebody wanted to set up a fixed line for me that I could jug up with my grigri and, you know, my whole setup, I would be definitely willing to do that. But actually going rock climbing outside is probably not something that I would be 100% comfortable with. I haven't rock climbed in two or three years and 510 is not going to look good on me. (laughs) Well, I've heard you talk about hiking and I've heard you talk about sea kayaking and, you know, some other adventures. So maybe this is not such a, a crazy question. What's your wellness routine? How do you stay in shape both mentally and physically to be able to be effective at this type of work? You know, I do have a membership at a local gym here in Bozeman. I do my best to go three times a week, though sometimes things happen and I miss a class. But that gym is based more around mountain fitness specifically, which I really love because it's targeting all the different muscles and movements that I would be using, you know, out on an elopement as well as in my own personal life, because I love to backpack and hike. So that really helps. But then also location scouting is another thing you know, if i am close enough to actually do it in person i will you know i usually show up beforehand and i'll go hike the trails to get a good idea of what they're looking like so yeah that's the physical side of it the mental side i do struggle with depression so it's not always easy not as many people get married in the winter especially when you're talking about outdoor adventure weddings i feel most comfortable in a hyper aroused state where I'm just constantly stimulated by being around people. I'm very extroverted. So that's how I get my energy. I love photographing. I love being outside. So like there's all these things about my job that really just gets me amped up. And then sometimes after being so amped up, even like a couple days later, you know, what goes up must come down. But especially throughout the winter years, I think it can be a lot harder to keep the mental aspect of my job going just because it is a lonely job, you know, working for yourself. Luckily, the elopement community in general is very tight knit, very close. I have several friends in different states who do the same thing and we can all chat together about the struggles and the good times and the bad times. Therapy, getting outside, soaking in sunshine, it's all part of the job and the ebbs and flows that come with it. Definitely. And really good point about making sure that, you know, you get outside and you soak up that sunshine, which leads me to ask you, do you only do this work within Montana or do you travel? Is there an opportunity to go to other places, which may be sunnier than our 
heavy winter months. And for li <laughs> listeners who may need some context about Montana winters, they can be very long and very harsh. You know, we don't always end our winter in March or April. Sometimes they extend further than that. So how about travel? Do you do it outside of Montana? On a regular basis, I say that, yes, I will travel to Wyoming, Idaho, nearby states. I won't generally charge extra for travel, but I do travel outside of my immediate area. I'd say two or three times a year, you know, I, I would allow for a bigger trip. Last summer, I did a week long overlanding elopement in Alaska. I got to not only go to Alaska, but then we spent a whole week in this totally kitted out truck with rooftop tents and just drove all over, hiked all over. It was fantastic. I prefer not to travel constantly because I do like to be home. You know, I chose to live in Montana because I do love it here. So I would like to spend most of my short summer time <laughs> enjoying what little of it we do have before winter strikes again. So yeah, that's definitely something I'm always willing to do with couples for sure. And you've described yourself as being a bit of a rule breaker and a bit of a boundary pusher. How do these characteristics factor into what you're doing? I think having an elopement itself is baked into it. The traditional meaning of an elopement is you don't think we should get married, but we're going to run off to Vegas and do it anyway. In more recent years, the the definition of an elopement has changed a lot where it's more focused around being very intentional about what you want to do, where you want to have your wedding, who you want there. Yeah, I've talked with a lot of couples who I've worked with who either did vow renewals or ditched the big wedding because it was too overwhelming. And they're like, yeah, no, just wasn't for us. And in that sense, it's kind of like breaking the rules. You know, like there's this whole generation of people who are now getting married who are just kind of fed up with, well, this is the way it's always been done. So we're, that's how we're going to do it. You know, you, you have your ceremony, you see each other for the first time when somebody walks down the aisle and, you know, then you say your vows in front of hundreds of people and you have to feed everybody. You have to have dancing too, and you have to cut the cake and you have to do this. And it's like all these things that you have to, you have to, you have to. And I'm basically here to say like, no, you don't have to. How you get married it's it's supposed to be about you two. Do you like to go drive down a beautiful scenic road and get a Oreo milkshake at the end of it? Do you want your dog there with you? Do you or do you not want your parents there when you read your most intimate words to each other? So yeah, a lot of it is just deciding for yourself what you want your wedding day to be, what traditions, if any, you want to keep or throw out, new ones, old ones, doesn't matter. And so, yeah, it's a pretty special job to help couples get the permission that maybe they're seeking but don't necessarily need to have a wedding day that is just completely out of the box. You know, Jesslyn, I would say that there's probably some interest from my generation as well. So I'll be 50 at the end of this year. I've been married a couple of times and I've always said that if I got married again, it would either be at the top of a mountain where we could mm. ski or snowboard Heck down yeah. or maybe at a faraway place on a beach where, mm -hmm. you know, it's very isolated. I don't know. What advice would you give to a couple, no matter what generation they're from, mm -hmm. who may be considering doing this type of ceremony? What are you thinking and talking about for them to keep in mind so that you can gently set realistic expectations? The first thing that I like to tell people who are considering eloping is to let go of any ideas they may have about what their wedding day should look like. And one of my favorite exercises is to have the couple just talk about what does your best day together look like? You wake up on a Saturday morning and you, you're just spending the day together. What are the things that you guys love to do? So I think that kind of helps them to set the expectations for themselves, what their day can be like. I think a lot of 
people who hear about adventure weddings think that you have to go do some big impressive outdoor feat and I'm like no not at all anything that you want to do can be considered adventure really just letting them decide for themselves what they want that to look like for somebody who wants to do something more adventurous again back to my handy dandy questionnaires <laughs> I definitely have some questions in there about what they're comfortable with doing if they want to go hiking what is your limit. I don't want to recommend a 12 mile round trip hike if you're more like, okay, we're going to do three or six. Also coming out to Montana, I have a lot of clients who are coming from much lower elevation and coming out to Montana and hiking even at five or 6,000 feet is a very different experience than hiking at sea level or a thousand feet above sea level. So I always really prepare them. But yeah, it's it's very much about letting them decide, even on the day of, even in the moment, do you want to do this? I try my very best to let them be in full control. I am simply here to help and to provide my professional opinion about what is doable in a certain time frame. You've mentioned a couple of times about inevitably sometimes things do not go the way that you've planned. And that just has me thinking about wildlife. So can we talk oh. for a second about wildlife? <sighs> You're in the backcountry or some other remote, amazing place, just you, your clients, your camera equipment. Have you ever had an instance where you have encountered the unexpected and what happened? Well, luckily no bears, but we did have two summers ago, I was hiking in Two Medicine with a couple for uh, the morning before they had their big reception. And on our way down from the hike, there was a young bighorn sheep that was a little too curious. <laughs> he really wanted to get up close and personal. And I'm like, nope, nope. He's walking towards us. We're walking back up the trail. All right, people, let's back up the trail. <laughs> and then it just kept coming closer. And we were luckily by a little grove of trees. And I was like, okay, guys, we're going off the trail. Let us go up to the trees here, you know, have a little bit of cover, give him some space. And he walked by and I was like, oh, thank God, he's he's just going to continue up the trail. But then he stopped, turned around and like started coming back towards us. I was like, oh, my gosh, you've got to be kidding me. And, you know, the poor couple, they weren't stressed about the fact that there was an animal near them. They were more stressed about the fact that they were going to be late for their luncheon with their family. <laughs> and I was like, that's OK. You're the couple. You're allowed to be late to your own events. We're just going to do what we can to successfully avoid a weird encounter with this bighorn sheep. I always carry bear spray with me. I always have two cans of it just in case, you know, I need to use one on the way in. I would like to be able to get back out with no bear spray. You know, obviously I want to have extra in case I have to use it. Luckily I've never had to use it, but I did actually draw it in this instance. First time I've ever drawn my bear spray was for a sheep. The sheep walked back down the trail and it was at the very end of a switchback but he went off the switchback and I was like oh yes good he's off the trail but then 15 feet off the trail he just lays down and I'm like oh my gosh you've got to be kidding me like why <laughs> what is this sheep's problem today is he against weddings so anyway I had my bear spray drawn and I was like okay guys we're going to very slowly and calmly approach this sheep on the trail because you know it was a very steep drop off we couldn't exactly cut the trail to avoid having an encounter with the sheep and so I had it drawn and I was like I'm gonna stand here at the end of the switchback you guys are gonna keep walking down behind me when it switches and I will slowly back up keeping my eyes on this sheep nothing obviously happened I think he was just very curious but that's definitely the closest I've gotten to something we were within about 10 10 feet or less of this sheep and it was a little unnerving but <laughs> we navigated it safely I want to go back to something that you mentioned earlier in our conversation you talked really about linking your passion with your purpose 
-hmm. which is important because that leads to satisfaction in a lot of ways. What impact are you hoping to make or have you actually experienced through your work in the backcountry and working with couples? Well, to give you a little bit of insight, for those who aren't familiar with Simon Sinek and his work surrounding Start With Why and Find Your Why, that was a huge game changer for me. And it really put into focus what it was about what I was doing that I loved so much. And, you know, a lot of it is drawn from my own personal experiences with having freedom and having choice. My why is to authentically embrace and embolden others so that they feel empowered to experience and live their lives in uninhibited and intentionally chosen manners. So for me, with elopements, it's that type of service of being able to provide a safe space for couples, no matter their background, no matter who they love, it's a safe space for them to create and choose their wedding day that feels right for them as a couple. I've actually had two or three different couples who I've photographed vow renewals for specifically tell me that they really hated their wedding. Everything about it was miserable. They felt like they had to invite all these family members that they didn't like, they didn't get along with, or they didn't feel safe around. They told me specifically that this was like the best experience that they had ever had. It was exactly what they wanted their wedding to be. Hiking outdoors was one of the couple's biggest pastimes together. And so we did this six mile hike in Glacier and saw like three different waterfalls and sat by the lake. And it's an experience. Well, we've talked a lot about you being a photographer and what that looks like, but we haven't touched so much on your being an entrepreneur and launching and running and sustaining a business. What's been the most challenging aspect to doing that? Do you have any lessons learned or words of wisdom that you would like to share? I had no idea the extent of and the scope of everything that would be involved with running my own business. It is so much more than I thought it would ever be. And that makes it challenging, but I think it also makes it that much more rewarding to kind of look back and be like, look at all these hoops I've jumped through, all these challenges I've met, these obstacles I've come over. And I'd say for me, the hardest thing that I personally struggle with is task initiation. When it comes to clients, absolutely no no issue there. I love what I do. I love helping people plan their weddings. I love photographing them. I love editing their photos afterwards. I know tons of photographers outsource that because they're like, oh, it's just a waste of time. Other than obviously being there and photographing it, it's literally my favorite part of my job. But more, I mean more like task initiation in regards to business administration things, the things on the back end of actually running a business that are not in my zone of genius. I am horrible about writing blogs consistently. I have a hard time navigating SEO. I understand it, but the work involved with just that aspect is overwhelming to say the least. For you know anybody looking to start their own venture. Have a good support group around you because that really does make a world of difference. Like that and outsourcing, which is something I am actually in the very beginning stages of finally getting around to doing. You don't have to be good at absolutely everything in your business and you don't have to do everything in your business. Sometimes it can be scary to think like, oh, I'm going to be spending all that money hiring somebody else to do this thing that I could do for myself. But it's freeing up so much of my time. Sometimes you do, you know, the age old saying, have to spend some money to make some money, <laughs> which can be very terrifying. But in business, that's that's the giant leap of faith that you inevitably have to take at some point. That kind of ties back to that discussion that we had earlier about your wellness. Because mm -hmm. if you're not 
as overwhelmed or as stressed with yes. these things. And you have the ability to create community and to lean on others for their zone of genius mm -hmm. so that they can do what they do. So you can do what you do that in and of itself yeah. leads to a really good mental kind of state. Oh, hugely. So Jesslyn, what's next for you? Oh boy, that's a big question. You know, one of my biggest goals is to go to Alaska each summer. That's what I would love. I would love to go up there for a week or two every single summer to do elopements in the gorgeous Alaskan wilderness. Gosh, as far as anything else that's next, you know, I've got a couple lined up for Idaho, obviously Glacier, because that's a very popular area. There's a lot of potential inquiries are still coming in, which is part of what I love about elopement inquiries is that, you know, you never know when they're going to come in. I've, I've planned them as far as two years out and in as little as 10 days. So it's a wild ride. Is there anything that I have not asked you about that you'd like to talk about? As far as something that I like to talk about, you know, with elopements is the importance of leave no trace and sustainability. That is a very big role in why I love doing them. There are several instances where people, you know, are kind of eloping because it's starting to become more and more of a trend and people are like, well, that's cool. We can do that too. But either the photographer doesn't know or the couple doesn't know that, you know, when you're on public lands, it's so important to respect the land that you're on and actually leave no trace. You know, you don't want to leave your flower petals, you know, don't be throwing rice and, you know, digging holes in the ground to put up an arch. Because, you know, if every single person were doing that every single week when they got married, we wouldn't have these beautiful spaces to actually come back to. And that's like a thing that I really love to drive home for my couples. You know, when I explain to them that I follow leave no trace principles and I expect every single person who's participating in this elopement or intimate wedding to be doing the same because five, 10, 25, 50 years down the road, they can come back to that same spot on an anniversary or just see it whenever and have that space to come back to. You know, you can't really do that with a venue. It's such a beautiful space and we want other people to be able to enjoy it. We want you to be able to come back and enjoy it. It's just very important to to know what the rules and regulations are for where you're going, what is allowed, what isn't, how many people can be in the space is a huge one. You know, people think they can take 30 people just anywhere and that's not always the case. So I think that's probably the other big thing that I really like to drive home about eloping specifically in the outdoors. Thanks so much, Jesslyn, for sharing your passion for love and for nature <laughs> with you. us today. I can't wait to hear more about your future adventures. And listeners, if you are getting ready to tie the knot and you're looking for a less conventional option, I've put Jesslyn's website link in the show notes so you can reach out and chat with her on what your next big adventure looks like. Join me again next Friday for another amazing woman and her story on another edition of Two Gals and a Mic. I'll see you then.